Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jan Roos. And I have another operations podcast. And this is specifically about different types of hiring. So I want to start this off by saying that I've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and it's because we started Case Fuel, formerly Expert Engines back in the day, from literally me just kind of being a dude who was, I guess, freelancing would probably be the appropriate word at the time. But building that up to the team that we currently have with, I honestly don't know, I think it's 18 at some point, but I have my staff hiring other staff at this point. So it's not something I actually know, which is cool. But along the way, we've made basically every mistake possible. And I also want to say that these are things that I made from a cash constrained position, which is also something that I know a lot of the solos are probably familiar with. And um, believe it or not, some of the bigger firms too, and you guys know who you are, definitely have been there myself in terms of being cash constrained and running a larger operation, right? So one of the things that makes a lot of sense or seems to make a lot of sense and can make a lot of sense if you make sure that you're doing the right stuff to negate the downsides is hiring staff part-time and freelance. And I want to go over some of the ways that we think about this today and some of the ways that we've made some mistakes. And hopefully this can be something that you guys can um, learn from and not get into the same mistakes that uh, we've had. So anywho, let's go ahead and get started. So when it comes to part-time staff, it's something that I've made a lot of use of, especially when I was scaling the company. But at the point that we're at right now, I no longer hire part-time staff. So the reason why is because part-time staff is really, really hard, or at least getting part-time staff that attends to stay part-time is not a great situation generally. The reason why I don't like part-time staff is because, especially if they have another concern that's like work-related, then the chances that they're going to actually be using, it's not about their time, it's really about their energy to actually help you build your business is, is really, really much less likely if the the person is full time. There's a concept that I really like from one of my favorite podcasts, uh, Tropical MBA with Dan Andrews. And he talks about this and he calls it shower time. And you guys have probably been in the same boat again, whether you own your law firm or you're an employee of the law firm, that when you have a full time job, if you have something that you're stressing about, sometimes you have ideas that will pop up about work when you're daydreaming or in the shower, right? I'm just using that as an example, or, you know, when you're waiting for, you know, the cashier at the grocery store, whatever it happens to be. And that's because full time work occupies a lot of space in your brain, right? So when it comes time to like ruminate on these things, that really is where some of the best breakthroughs come from. You can't reasonably expect that from part-time staff. You can definitely not expect that from part-time staff if they have a side hustle. And again, I will say this with uh, you know the full acknowledgement of how hypocritical it is for me to talk about <laughs> how I feel about people starting side hustles, which you know, in, some, in some capacities, what I'm doing right now was started as a side hustle, but it takes one to know one. I definitely was not thinking about the full-time work that I was doing when I was trying to launch this company. So, and that, that's kind of the thing. So it's like, you have to be realistic. And again, I don't have anything wrong with people doing side hustles. Just, you know, don't take a paycheck from me when you're doing it. And I don't think if you're an employer, you should be taking a check for, or giving checks to people if they're doing it, right? Because that's the thing. It's like, you know, realistically, when you start thinking about human resources as a resource, then the amount of energy and training and systems, all these things you're building out to you are to build an asset. And once you've gone through, you know, five, 10 years of hiring, you start to get really frustrated when you're teaching people the same stuff because somebody didn't stick around for whatever reason. So that's pretty much that. There are circumstances where I think part-time work makes sense, but it's when the other part of that time isn't taken by another job or something else that's that's kind of for money, right? So situations I'd love to hire part-time for are full-time moms people who are caretakers for family members, people who for whatever reason have, you know, physical ailment that prevents them from working more than 20 or 25 hours a week. Those are fine. And the reason why I make that distinction is because that doesn't encroach on their shower time. You're still 100% of their employment, but you know, they're just not giving you 40 hours per week because it's not a realistic situation for that. So I think those are great. And if you're in the position where you'd like to hire somebody that's part-time because you can't afford somebody who's full-time, those are the kind of people that I would recommend going for. 
to this day, one of the best job boards that I have ever used. And I'm not sure what it's like right now because I haven't hired there in a bit, but there used to be a fantastic job board called hiremymom.com. No joke. It's still a business. I just haven't used it in a while, but it's great because you have situations where people have when I mean, most of the moms in there are, uh, are biologically women. Uh, <laughs> uh, these, uh, these women have, uh, you know, they're sometimes they have a situation where they took time off. They had, you know, a couple kids in a couple of years and they got a couple of tykes running around and their husband's at the office. And this is, what's also fantastic for this situation for somebody who's up and coming is that a lot of these people have health insurance through their partner, which is great. But, you know, that's, that's a situation where, you know, it's like, you know, they're obviously, you know, if, if you can be a hundred percent of that person's financial stuff, but that hundred percent only happens to be 20 hours. That is a win-win as far as I'm concerned. So. What else? So when we're talking about freelancers, this is kind of the other situation that I want to be really just careful about protecting the downside on. So and I'll go ahead and say this. And you know, this podcast is gonna be edited by a freelancer. And if you're editing this, thank you for editing. <laughs> I really appreciate the work. But um, the main things that we do at this point in time are primarily tasks that we don't necessarily have a enough full time work to potentially do or even part time work, right? So we are able to use freelance work to to get those things done as they're needed, right? There's no way I could have enough audio work to pay the person who's editing this 40 hours a week. There's literally no way that would make sense. I might as well have to start a podcasting company at that point. Similarly, we don't have a situation where we have enough work for video editor, although we have more than that, right? So the major thing that we have to be respectful of for a freelancer is that you are not their main concern. So I think it goes without saying, but you're not going to be expecting creative process improvements to be coming from your freelancer. It'd be fantastic if they did. I mean, that's the farthest thing. You are definitely not in the shower time for a freelancer, but that's an accepted arrangement, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that you need to be respectful that the freelancer has their own schedule. And they probably have more clients. And there's things that we've noticed a couple of times too, where freelancers are really, really awesome. And then people realize that they're really awesome and then they get more work that they can do with, which doesn't mean that we stop working with the freelancer, but we just have to figure out what is realistic from a time perspective. And this is mostly the time that we have to build into when we can reasonably expect the work to come by. So that's kind of a trade-off with freelancers. You know, you have reliability, but not necessarily reliability when you need it. And and it is sort of a situation that can change as time goes on. One of the things, and this is another situation where I would probably, I'm going to contradict what I said before, and this is actually a situation where I think it would make sense to have part-time, is that if you have a situation where you have ongoing work, and you know we've done this a couple of times, we have you know people that work in this capacity as a freelancer for, we've, we've had people doing this for five, six years at Case Fuel. When you have enough work and it's steady enough work that you actually become more important than the next Fiverr gig that comes across their desk. When you have that position, it makes sense, in my opinion, to overpay those folks and potentially get those guys on a retainer. So again, this is kind of going in that part-time direction, but it's sort of a give to get situation. If we have, you know, X amount of work coming in per month and say, Hey, look, you know, you guys are representing a good part of our work with this. I don't know what your situation is, but if we're representing a decent amount of billing, let's make it official. And we're going to be paying you this every single week or every single month, hell or high water with the understanding that sometimes we're going to be overpaying for this, but we need to have such and such expectations met as far as when we have deliverables. Is that fair to you? And they might say yes, they might say no. But when you have that kind of a situation, it's good because basically you can get the downside risk of not necessarily having reliability in terms of the timelines kind of mitigated. And you also give them something to lose, right? If the situation ends up being where, you know, they end up having a bunch of other clients, but you already had this discussion, then basically, you know, you have every freelancer. And if, if you guys have ever been in the situation where you guys have been freelancing yourselves, the grind of not knowing where your rent's going to come from the next month really, really sucks. So even if you can offset that a little bit with some steady money, people will do a lot for that. But again, this is not necessarily a bulletproof strategy. People can say no, people can say yes, and then decide that the situation has changed. But um, that's basically something that we've done in the past to make sure that we're having a better situation with the, uh, the, the freelancers that we're working with. Another thing that we have noticed and I kind of like to think of this as just sort of the accessory work. So we, and um, I don't know how much, I'm trying to think, we had a recent episode that was talking about our not using email whatsoever and, and having everything centralized in this on, which is fantastic. It's something that we have everyone on the team doing. But just to be completely honest, we do not really have this stuff focused on with freelancers. And I personally don't think it would be fair to expect freelancers to do uncompensated work on a system that's just for a single client, right? 
So if you think about it, if you're paying them per project, I mean, just it, a lot of this stuff really boils down to basic common sense and empathy. Would you want to spend five hours for learning somebody else's, you know, project management system so that you could get work from that person when you have other people that they can give you work without you having to fit into this kind of system, right? So our philosophy on this, and we actually have had people that we've, uh, you know, this is just one of those I handle the doses moments. We've had freelancers that got stuff that was out of scope and decided to say, hey, look, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I think I'm going to be going in my own direction now. So I try to be extremely clear with what the scope of work is. And I try to be extremely clear to everyone on my team that if you really don't put that stuff out of scope, that's a bummer. No one wants to do that, right? And again, you run the risk of losing a freelancer, potentially a good one if you want to violate that. So when you're working with freelancers, you need to have somebody that is managing them that is taking care of all of that internal stuff for them, like sort of uh, an ambassador, if you will, or handler, right? So if you have somebody who's using a freelancer, that person is responsible for updating all that stuff. If that's you, then you're responsible for updating that stuff just to keep the rest of the team. And this is sort of, I guess you could consider it almost like an API for getting these external vendors to work with an internal system, provided you have a system that's, that's you know, big enough where you can't do it any other way. This is going to be more of a concern for people who are a little bit farther along the journey, but you know, it's something super, super important that we've learned the hard way for not doing. But basically, Basically, if you can kind of keep those considerations into mind, you can absolutely work with part-time people. You just got to make sure why they're part-time. And you can absolutely work with freelancers, but you just need to make sure that you're realistic on expectations and what's fair for them at the end of the day. But if you can do that, you know, you don't necessarily have to hire full-time for everybody. And that's great because there's also downsides to hiring people full-time when there's not enough work, which I might have to go over in another episode. But anyways, chew on that stuff, guys. Let me know what you think. And for everybody else, I will see you guys next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Eastern on the Law Firm Growth Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.